welcome to our program. I'm Julia Brown, and I am pleased to be making this presentation as part of the International Committee of ASALA, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of the International Committee, namely Gloria J. Brown Marshall and Barbara Spencer Dunn. Who am I? I am Julia Brown, walking the CEO and founder of Walking the Spirit Tours Black Paris and Beyond. Since 1994, we have edu we educate on Black heritage through tourism, through tours that we create ourselves, through lectures, through films, and on programs like this. My fascination with France started when I was uh, still in my teens, and when I finally moved to Paris in 1990, um, four years into it, I had the fortune of studying with a man um, who was the expert on the subject, so I'd like to pay tribute to the late um, Michel Fabre, Professor Emeritus of the Sorbonne Nouvelle. He started me on this journey of learning and educating, and now I my, my mission is to help people of all backgrounds make connections and to delve into Black heritage, whether they travel in France or elsewhere with our partners. You can see here our contact information, and we will you can we will put this uh, panel up again at the end of the uh, at the end of this program. Now, Black resistance around the world has shown itself very differently, but at the same time, very much the same. Black peoples have been pushing back against harsh obstacles for centuries and still today. Today, I'm focusing on how that fight looked in the past in France and how it is today on, in both France and in the French territories. The program continues will contain these elements here. Um, it's a four-part four program. We'll start with enslavement, though we, though we don't, we do know that um, Black people were traveling through France long before the event of the marker of, sla of, of uh, slavery. But we'll start with enslavement, and then we go to African West, uh, French West Indians, African Americans as they come together in Paris in the 1920s. We'll talk about Josephine Baker, of course, and we'll talk about Bordeaux. Not for the wine, but for its little secret that we're about that uh, is being revealed little by little. Let's go straight to what inspired the first successful um, revolt of enslaved people in the New World. Out of the French Revolution in 1789 came the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. And it lays out the core values of the French Revolution. And you can see the first article starts, men are born and remain free and equal in rights. Of course, that didn't apply to enslaved people and nor to women for that matter. But we, the fact of, is it, fact of it is that it did inspire the, the Haitian Revolution. But, you know, the authors of the, of the Declaration of, of uh, Rights of Man document and the entire nation of the descendants couldn't fathom that uh, the revolution's ideals of freedom and equality could light such a fierce fire in the Black peoples that, that they had working under horrific conditions on their plantations. Well, let's, let's tell that story. We'll start in Paris, and then we will circle back to the French Caribbean. This is the stat, the first statue of a Black woman in Paris, and, 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 uh, actually is the only one to date, believe it or not. It's on a little square of grass in the 17th district on the north end, north uh, west end of Paris. And on the plaque that's at the edge of this uh, of this little grassy square, her title is called, they called her the, the Mulatresse, the Mulatto Solitude. And from her stance, you can see that she's fighting tooth and nail. And what's she fighting for? Well, she's actually fighting against the reestablishment of slavery on her island of Guadeloupe. Let me tell you a little bit about her. She's born about 1780. She represents Caribbean women and mothers who fight to uphold the ideals of equality and freedom as was laid out in the Rights of Man, the Doc Declaration of Rights of Man. So what rights did they, did they have? Well, um, slavery was was, was um, abolished in 1794. So they had rights from that, uh, technically they had rights from that point forward. 
But when word came just six years later after that abol uh, the first abolition that the French had full intention of reestablishing slavery, well, she led to, she led a small group of rebel of rebel maroons into the Guadalupan Hills, and there they joined up with other organizers of 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 this um of this re of this re resistance movement. And among them was a man called uh, he was from Martinique, Martinique uh, Louis Delgres. And so, unfortunately, the band of them, as many as they numbered, they were outnumbered by the French. Um, and so, where they took uh, refuge was a place called the Plantation d'Aglemont. They had a they had a strategy though, even though they were they knew they'd be outnumbered. They waited until about five hundred of the troops of the French troops got close enough, and then they let out a cry, a live or die proclamation that says to the whole universe, the last cry of innocence and despair, and that they lit the they ignited the stores of dynamite that they had. 400 of the French troops um, and most of the Marines of the Maroons uh, did not survive, but Solitude did. You can see from the statue that she was pregnant at the time and she was taken prisoner. It was around May the 23rd and she was held. She was tortured until after, just after the day after she gave birth. So she was executed November the 29th, 1802. There are many tributes to the mulatto solitude around Guadalupe. You hear them in songs, you hear them in poems. And now she's the first black woman. She represents the first black woman statue in Paris. That statue was unveiled uh, on May the 10th, 2022. So pretty recently. And May the 10th is the day um, in France where the uh, the the, the commemoration for the final abolition of slavery, which took place in 1848. Now that date, May the 10th, is changed, is, is different from, from island to island community. But if you are in France in on May the 10th, you can participate or you will see commemorations for the last abolition of slavery, 1848. Now, what made Guadeloupe, Martinique, and the other colonies uh, believe that they could hold out against the European forces, those same forces that were hell-bent on protecting and saving their sources of the wealth, their wealth and their power? This man. Toussaint Louverture. Toussaint Louverture, he was formerly enslaved. He became a free man. And when the war for the freedom of the island of Saint-Domingue kicked off in 1791, he was in it right from the very beginning, right from the start. This is uh, Saint Domingue, right in the middle. And just to just to give you, if you're not familiar where that is in the Caribbean, you see Florida right at the very top, the tip of Florida, Cuba to the left of the island, and on the left and along the bottom, you'll see Central and South America. Now, Toussaint Louverture. Uh, so, just let me tell you a little bit about uh, about that island. Actually, it was half French and half Spanish, and it was the crown jewel of the European uh, plantation economy. I mean, when the ships left here, laden down, they were literally the ships were literally groaning under the weight and the wealth of all the cocoa, the coffee, the sugar, the indigo, and all that produced by. Continue, a continually renewable, renewed source of African bodies. Toussaint Louverture, he rose up to the ranks, to the ranks of general in the military. He and his he and his generals had wanted so much more for their people than a freedom from uh, slavery. The man on the left is Toussaint Louverture. He was politically savvy. He was an astute tactician and a, and a strategist. He played the Spanish, the French, and the British one against each other. But what was the leadership life of, of Haiti under, under him? Well, he, the economy of the island was rebalanced under his leadership. The people who worked on the plantations now worked for pay. And he established trade relations with the UK and the US. So with that kind of political savvy, he was able to take over first the colony of Santo Domingo and then the entire island. And then in 1801-1802, he established a constitution that demanded autonomy from France. Now, I, I should say at this point in, in the 18th century, the word, the notion of black 
and the notion of slavery were synonymous. They meant the people to most people they associated them as the same as the same thing. So really, how can slave people ever have the ability to determine their own future? How could they rule their own nation? I mean, it was it was laughable. It was inconceivable, especially to the man on the right hand side, Napoleon Bonaparte. He was a commander of the most powerful army in the world. And again, so he again, he sends in his troops to capture Louverture. The black general, Louverture, he was amenable to the military's offer. And so he agreed to a meeting. And when they finally came face to face, they captured him and they put him on a ship and sent him. I'll tell you where in a second. But let the the man in the middle, Jean Jacques Dessalines, is the one who took it over. He took the revolution over this over the finish line. So Louverture's successor is Dessalines, and who declares independence of Haiti in 1804. Um, and he renamed it uh, the, the and he renamed the, the island Haiti, and it became the first independent black nation in the world. Where did Toussaint Louverture uh, end up? They sent him to Bordeaux. You can see that on the left-hand side, the bottom left, to the southwest of France, in the region of Aquitaine. You see the bust of Louverture, which, which, was, which was a gift from Haiti some 200 years after the, the revolution. And that bust is overlooking. In the very back there, you see there's a river. It's called the Garonne River, which the, on which Bordeaux is, is uh, sits. And from that very point on the Garonne River, 500 slave ships left Bordeaux, went to Africa, picked up their captives, and took them to the French Caribbean. So that's where he landed, but that's not where he ended up. You look across the map, across France, and you see another bust, and you see the words Fort de Joux, Fort de Joux. And that is where um, Toussaint Louverture was imprisoned. You can see the fortress at the top of this, uh, at the top of this image here. And this doesn't look like there's no escaping, but he probably didn't have the strength to escape. You see the um, on the bottom of this cell, it looked nice and clean now, but it was it was cold and it was miserable. And he died there months later. You can visit that cell now in commemoration and honor to pay, pay tribute to Toussaint Louverture. It's on a particular route called the Route to the Abolition of Slavery. So that's one of the commemoration points you will find in France commemorating um, this uh, the enslavement. Um, and you can get there. Um, it takes a bit of a, an effort. You take the, for example, you take the train to Lyon, uh, then you take uh, another rail, you take a car, and then you walk a little bit. But um, it is a place that is well visited. Now, is slavery in the slave trade part of the national narrative of, Fran of France these 200 years on. Are there other commemorations, places of commemoration? Well, the teaching of uh, France and its role um, as part of the national uh, in schools is mandatory in the secondary school level, but it's uh, it can be a little bit selective, a little bit uh, superficial. So you're not going to get the whole picture. You have to take it on yourself to find out. And that's why the comm commemorations year after year are have, have such important work to do. Um, there are those who, of course, who refuse to let the struggles, uh, the struggles um, against slavery be relegated to a full uh, to a footnote. In 2001, the then Minister of Justice, um, representing um, French Guyana Christian, Madame Christian Taubira, she re um, she sponsored a landmark law that had uh, got slavery, enslavement, and the slave trade. Uh, trafficking recognized as a crime against hum humanity. So where can you see in signs of that um, through France? Um, the number one slave port in France is uh, was in Nantes, uh, whereas Bordeaux, there was 500 ships that left from there. Uh, in Nantes, Nantes uh, in the, on the border of Brittany, it's 1,700 ships. Um, and that, the, the story in Nantes, the commemorations, the way that it is um, remembering its, its role, it's worth a presentation all of its own. So I'll do that another time. But let's say that if you wanted to take a road trip to mark out some of the places, some of these ports, 
that were slave ports. You would start, for example, in Normandy in the Le Havre, where many of the cruise ships board, you'd come down to Brittany to Nantes, you'd continue on down to uh, La Rochelle, Bayonne, and then end up in, in, in Bordeaux. This, what you're looking at here, is the, mem the memorial that was established in 2001, uh, sorry, 2002 in Nantes. Paris, the meeting place. It's been called the meeting place for thousands of years, but also for the in the interest of this story, it's been the meeting place for expats from across the world. Meeting place, a meeting place in is meaning meeting in meeting in cafes and meeting in not only cafes but in in education institutions like the universities. So quite fittingly, the Afro-descendants of the, of the diaspora met together in Paris and influenced each other there for the very first time. And here, resistance came again, like I said, through the written word. The photo here is from the 1950s, taken in front of the Sorbonne University, um, the gathering of black intellectuals. Um, but at the Sorbonne, african American um, as Afro descendants have been studying since, since before the since the turn of the century, including um, Carter G. Woodson. Now, what was going on in Paris at the time? The nineteen twenties. Um, Paris in the nineteen twenties was had come out of the out of World War One, and it wanted they wanted desperately to live fully, to noisily and to break through all the boundaries. That period gave birth to the Roaring Twenties, or what we also call it the Jazz Age. Um, and it would have been nothing without the exploitation and the embrace of the Black, of black culture. What the world saw and heard was jazz in that period. Uh, jazz introduced to uh, France and to Europe by the African-American soldiers who fought in World War I. And then it became the soundtrack in the, all the nightclubs, many of the nightclubs in Paris, right up in, in the Pigalle area, Pigalle area in the north end of Paris, right near the Moulin Rouge, um, where Black Montmartre was in the 1920s. And one of those clubs was owned by this woman. You've seen the photograph, uh, Bricktop. Um but it also you could also find jazz in the swanky clubs of the along the Champ, around the Champs Elysees area. They talked about the influence of black culture, black. Uh, they talked about the influence of black sculptures, um, black art, down in the south end of Paris, with international uh, international artists gathered. So you can see Picasso and his uh, influence there. But it was also the time of Art Deco. Uh, which was influenced by African art. And it was a time also that France was at the height of its um, colonial powers. So a lot of Africa and African-American, Afro-descendant culture in the city at that same time, in the same meeting place. Less visibly and intentionally less visible was the African, Caribbean, and the African-American writers, artists, intellectuals using Paris as a meeting place to sharpen their voice, to join forces and to define and redefine black culture away from prying eyes and ears. Many of that activity set, much of that activity saw, um, focused around the Sorbonne, but also in the, uh, in the suburbs. This video that you're about to watch will take you behind the scenes of the movement that gave birth to the Negritude Movement. Through the 1920s and into the 30s, the transatlantic exchanges between writers from French West Africa, the French West Indies, and the Harlem Renaissance continued to grow, all converging on Paris, the hub of the African diaspora. And the hub of the hub was to be found just outside the city, in the suburb of Clamart, at the home of the remarkable Nardell sisters from Martinique. They were just great at bringing people together. They, they had a, a literary salon, in fact, and, and their uh, black American writers would meet uh, writers from Africa and the Caribbean. 
they just hooked people up and, and, and made things happen. They had a magazine called um, Revue du Monde Noir, publishing articles by uh, Leopold Sangor and also Langston Hughes uh, published in there. So they were helping create that link between um, African Americans and black people from the, from the Francophone world. They're all writing and thinking about what it means to be black globally. They're talking about transnationalism. They're talking about pan-Africanism. They're talking about a diasporic connections, what it meant to be black globally, how those experiences could be defined differently and simultaneously, where there were points, um, where, the, where there were meeting points. In 1929, Claude McKay publishes a novel called Banjo, which is set in Marseille. And there he gives you a very different picture of what the Harlem Renaissance means, because this is not a novel about upward mobility, about striving, about self-expression and liberation. It's a novel about these small, fleeting communities of struggling musicians on the docks, trying to make a living and finding themselves harassed by labor unions on one side, by the police on the other, who harass itinerant black workers in the period. For McKay, it's important to highlight that experience in the 1920s, that proletariat, lower class, African-American, African and African Afro-Caribbean experience in the 1920s, because that's the reality of it. And he was somebody who'd seen a lot. He'd been in Russia during the early days of the, of the Russian Revolution. He'd seen a lot of suffering. He'd seen a lot of hypocrisy as well. And he was not about to take on face value the pretensions of the French to, um, to be these you know, egalitarian paragons. Paulette Nardal felt that Martinican and Guadalupean communities had much to learn from the African-American example because she felt that African-Americans had arrived at race consciousness or racial awareness and acceptance much earlier than residents of the French Caribbean. So she thought that by following the model of writers such as Langston Hughes and writers such as Claude McKay, who were unafraid to openly declare not only their racial identity, but also their anger at racism in the United States, Caribbean intellectuals could in turn learn to embrace their racial identity while negotiating their positions as French citizens. But the leftist poet Aimé Césaire from Martinique and Leopold Senghor, the future president of Senegal, who came to the Salon, took these Harlem Renaissance-inspired ideas in a more aggressive direction. While working on the student newspaper they founded in Paris, they launched a movement called Negritude. Actually, the word Negritude was created by Césaire. The word is based on subverting a very negative world, negritude, which we picked up and redefined positively. There are sort of parallel movements, but but both are involved. Uh, both are, are 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 focused on this idea of of celebrating uh, the history of black people, of 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 breaking free from the from the the, the, the legacy uh, of oppression, of slavery, of colonialism, um, and and really saying that there is such a thing as 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 a black identity that's as as strong and worthwhile and valuable as, as anything else in any other uh, culture. Josephine Baker needs no introduction, except I could start by saying that she was probably the least likely person that anybody would have expected to be a force of resistance. But pro through progress early on and uh, through astute alliances, she worked from within the French system on many levels. As you will see in this video, um, she progressed from being a showgirl to um, owning a business that appealed to the masses and to the elite. And she also was recruited by the French, the head of the French uh, counter-military intelligence in to be uh, in the role of espionage. Um, when even after the war, she didn't retire to her, retire to her beautiful chateau and said, call it the end of a fine career. No, she took on racial discrimination and redefined what the national identity looked like. Watch this video for a fascinating look at Josephine Baker's life and legacy.
proyectos futuros na de distelli. On April 8, 1975, a spectacular show opened in Paris. It was simply called Josephine. That was the only name it needed. The president of France sent her a telegram in the name of the country, congratulating her on her 50th anniversary as a performer in France. The show was a triumph. But the next day, while reading her glowing reviews at home, Josephine Baker fell asleep and never woke up. Twenty thousand Parisians came out for her as the funeral cortege made its way to the Church of the Madeleine. It was the grandest funeral ever for an American in France, and it was for far more than her greatness as a performer. She was given full military honors as a World War II resistance hero and saluted as a Chevalier of the Legion of Honor. A square in Paris was later named for her, the first for an African-American. Music hall artist, lieutenant in the Free French Forces, philanthropist. What a life she created. A young girl comes to Paris. She is sexy and funny and glamorous and outrageous all at the same time. And can she ever dance? La Baker, the French call her, will enthrall them for decades to come and she remains a fascinating personality to this day. But who was this girl who came out of nowhere? She was born poor, black, a washerwoman's daughter in a ghetto in St. Louis. At the age of 11, she experienced the race riot of 1917. I've been running all my life, she once said. But despite her deprived childhood with practically no schooling, Josephine's remarkable talent for dancing and making people laugh, saw her landing small but tasty roles in New York stage shows at a very young age. Her big break came at 19, her chance to join an all-black variety show that was sailing to France to premiere it in Paris. On October 2, 1925, the Revue Negra opened at the splendid Théâtre de Champs-Élysées. Though she was only hired for bit parts, the producer saw enough in Josephine to give her a feature, La Danse Sauvage, with partner Joe Alex. That was all she needed. She became a star overnight. French audiences perhaps weren't as focused on her nationality as they were on this kind of bronze beauty whose body um, seemed to evoke memories of Africa. She was the best of all worlds. She was this primitive African past and a modern, um, hip, um, kind of um, American Negro jazz present and was all embodied in one person. For many years before then, the music hall, the whole tradition of the French music hall had already been in very much international, something that received performers from throughout the world. But with Josephine Baker, you now had a woman of color, really for the first time achieving a very prominent place within it, not just as a performer in one play or one theatrical review, but somebody who could in some ways set her own terms. After two months in Paris, the Revue Negre went on the road, playing in Brussels and Berlin, the wildest city in Europe. Despite protests by Nazi brown shirts outside the theater, that Fraulein Baker was a menace to the Aryan race, the Revue Negre was as big a hit there as it had been in Paris. The show quickly folded, however, after its star suddenly quit and went back to Paris. The reason she left was to star in a new review at the Follies Bergère. In this show, just a year after her debut in La Vue Negre, Baker created an even greater sensation in the number for which she would be remembered forever, the Banana Dance. When she did it live at the theater, she was topless. She's supposed to be playing a bunch of bananas come to life. And I think that they represented um, the reach of France around the world to a place where they grow 
bananas, but also um, the ability to get those things, to have exotic things. So they were exotic, but they were also a sign of, of wealth. But having Baker in a skirt of bananas is that plus the idea of a girl as bananas, as fruit, as delectable fruit. But then it's a girl wearing phallic fruit, a lot of them. And she moves, and then each of the bananas moves on their own. So that what we're seeing is colonial fantasy in action. The idea that this guy, this classic white man, he doesn't do anything, he just lays there. And, and nature comes to him. And it's not just something he can eat, it's something he can eat. It's a girl, you know, and, and, and she performs just for him. And, and that's just classic bakerness, this kind of confusion of a number of different contexts and perspectives that swirl and shimmy together. In 1926, Josephine Baker came under the management of Giuseppe Abatino, known as Pepito, supposedly a Sicilian count, and supposedly her husband. He would remain her manager until his death ten years later. He's actually a quite savvy guy who has a family that's very talented. His sister is married to a musician by the name of Vincent Scorto, whom you, his name you'll recognize later because he is the author of J'ai Deux Amours, Baker's signature song and he wrote almost two dozen of Baker's early songs. So the fact that he might not have been a real count should not be poo-pooed. This man knew everybody, and he knew how to get things done. Pepito had great ideas for exploiting Josephine's fame. She put out a line of dolls. She opened a nightclub. She launched her own cosmetics business. She made a film. At the same time, she began learning to read, write, act, and sing in French, crossing over into the French world as almost no other African Americans did. In the fall of 1930, Josephine Baker had the hit of the season, Paris qui renew, or Paris when it sizzles, at the Casino de Paris. Here, Josephine first sang. J'ai deux amours, I have two loves. It later became her theme song, with Paris and America being her two loves, but not in this show. The two loves initially weren't the United States and France, as a lot of people think they were Vietnam and France. Baker never plays an African American in any of her uh, stage or film performances. She's always an exotic persona. This role in different guises, a woman of color of colonial origin in love with a Frenchman, became a staple in her repertoire. Josephine Baker never gets the guy because there's ultimately this, this prohibition against this kind of successful interracial love. But she desires the guy, which in some ways was even more important. So in other words, France is a country that is desired by its colonial subjects, both literally and also sexually. And I think that also helps to explain why she was so successful and why French men in particular found her um, performances so incredibly titillating, right? <laughs> By the late 1930s, Europe was on the road to war. In the months before the German invasion, Josephine entertained French troops on the eastern frontier. But at this very time, she was also in training as a secret agent for French military intelligence. In June 1940, when the Nazis marched into Paris, Baker had left, but it was a strategic retreat. She was in the south of France, risking her life for the Free French Underground, smuggling secret documents sewn into her gowns. When the liberation came in 1944, Lieutenant Baker was finally able to return home. She received the Medal of the Resistance for her bravery. From now on, she devoted herself to the ideal of racial harmony, 
setting an example with the Rainbow Tribe, a dozen children whom she and her band leader husband, Joe Bouillon, adopted from all over the world. They lived at Josephine's magnificent chateau on the Dordogne River, Les Milan. Meanwhile, she was fighting for civil rights in the USA, among the first entertainers to refuse to perform in front of segregated audiences. And at Dr. Martin Luther King's groundbreaking march on Washington in 1963, she was one of the featured speakers. Just an occasion to show respect to Dorothy, somebody that was a great entertainer, a great humanitarian, and I suppose, as far as I'm concerned, the thing that impresses me most about her was her political dedication. When we remember Baker, she is a most exceptional and extraordinary being whose goals and the end of whose life is not performance. You know, it's, it's amazing sleigh ride through her life, all of the things that she does that were fun, that were frightening, that are the stuff of novels, films, and uh, uh, plays, all of which have been made about her. But what's more important is what did she do with all of this? And she was able to do amazing things, or at least began to do amazing things, and leaves us with some unfinished business. Like, what are we going to do about multiculturalism today? What are we going to do about the educational pedagogical plan that Baker had? What are we going to do about the political um, goals that she set for the United States and for France? And those are the questions that she leaves us with in the 21st century. As a postscript, France honored Josephine Baker in November 2021 as the first Black woman to be interred into the French pantheon of, um, of French greats. You can see the pantheon is that building, that domed building up at the at the top of the hill there. Um, and while you're there, you can see, you can visit and you can see uh, Josephine Baker's, mar the marker for Josephine Baker in there, but also uh, other um, uh, Afro-descendants. The films that you've seen uh, on uh, Josephine Baker and on the uh, Negritude movement, their intellectuals, were produced, were part of the production of Blue Line films, of which I am part of. And we produce films and documentaries around the Black experience around the world, but also specifically in uh, in France. So I have, you can see the vid the link there that will take you to see our many of our productions, including our latest one. On the top left-hand side, you can see Fighting for Respect, which is about the African-American soldiers in World War I and what it was like when they went back to the United States. I wanted to share with you some lesser known, but just as powerful efforts of resistance since the negative movement. But, and these are carried out by grassroots movements and working class movements. When the working class of uh, class residents of France's colonies, former colonies and overseas departments started migrating to France after World War II, France was going through a massive reconstruction and industrialization period. Well, there were apartment buildings to be built, there were museums to be built, there was transportation to improve and to be manned, there was hospitals to be staffed. So these newcomers came with sk as skilled and unskilled workers, and their presence started changing the racial makeup of France, as you well can imagine. But there is no way to quant there was no way at the time to quantify effectively the experiences of the newcomers. So how do you protest against discrimination in a system where the national census makes it illegal to collect data on race and ethnicity? 
So there's no on the census there's no box for black or our other and other and ethnicities, and so how do you qualify quantify then the life of the these newcomers from the islands and from the African colonies and the South, the Asian colonies, how do you quantify their experiences? If there's no markers, there's no mechanisms for that. And so they become, a gr this growing number of workers become um, invisible because there is no uh, quantification and yet they're very, very visible. That is a challenge for life. That is the challenge of life. Uh, that is spawned that spawned many resistance movements. I'm going to mention a few of them here, um, and I mentioned this one in particular because it's a federation um, of of associations, and it's called the um, Representative Council of the Black Associations. And they, since 2005, advocate against discrimination, whether it's in the workplace or education, access to education, like entrance exams to higher education or to government jobs, for example. Um, they advocate for um, reparations, even the, the right to use the word noir, which, which means black. So this video you're about to see um, gives you a glimpse at some of the causes and effects of resistance over the past 60 years. Activism began showing up in more disruptive protests when larger numbers of working class Africans began migrating to France following the independence of the former colonies. Strike action from the 1960s forward centered around distressing housing and work conditions. Their children, born in France, put it to music. The emergence of French rap in the early 1990s shouted out the rage and frustration building up in the low income housing complexes in the nearby suburbs. Then the inconceivable shocked France and beyond. In 2005, two neighborhood teen boys were electrocuted while being chased by police in those underprivileged suburbs. Weeks of rioting spilled over into Paris and to 273 other French cities. The fact that the police weren't charged only added to the ongoing outcries over high unemployment, social exclusion, discrimination, and police harassment. Today's activists operate from all spheres of influence. This last segment uh, of the presentation takes you to a place that you wouldn't off the top of your head associate with black resistance, Bordeaux, the beautiful city of Bordeaux. It is designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site because of its beautiful architecture, but also as a first class, um, a first class wine production region. You know, there are over 7,000 vineyards in this area, but uh, Bordeaux has another secret, and we're about to learn about it in the next two videos. Well, it's not so much a secret, it's just something that's coming to, that's being brought to the forefront little by little. The theme of our program is resistance, and our guest today uses that force on many fronts. Please welcome Karfa Sierra Diallo. He is the founder and he's the director of the association Memoir et Partage, Memories and Sharing. The association is based in Bordeaux, the south in France, and the association has made it their mission to give the general public and those in city governments educational tools to trace the history of slavery, slave trafficking, and colonialism. So that history has remained hidden, firmly hidden, like in the in the background for until about 30 years ago. So Mr. Diallo arrived in Bordeaux from Senegal, where he's from, and to continue his studies from law and then took up political science in um, the University of Bordeaux. And it was here during his studies that he came face to face with the taboo of talking about the city's slavery past. So the resistance of Bordeaux has become his action of resistance. So I'm going to start. Um, thank you um, again, Mr. Diallo, for um, being present with us today and for the work you do. Thank you for your inv invitation, uh, Julia Brown. I'm very, very happy, very honored to 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 participate to your 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 emission. Um, effectivement, uh, pour les jeunes Africains qui arrivent en en France dans les années 90, euh, qui arrivent notamment à Bordeaux, on, on arrive dans une ville euh, que nous connaissions déjà, 
tous les, euh, les Africains de l'Ouest, hein, je suis originaire du Sénégal, vous l'avez dit, mais aussi les Antillais, ont dans leur imaginaire Bordeaux. Puisque... It's a favorite destination for cruise boats and wine connoisseurs, but Carfa Diallo is more interested in another side of Bordeaux as one of Europe's busiest slave trading hubs. From the 17th to the 19th century, this city dispatched hundreds of ships that transported 130,000 slaves from Africa to the Americas. They returned laden with cotton, tobacco, sugar and rum. The city partly built its wealth on the slave trade. Here we are at Place de la Bourse. It was among the most beautiful squares in France. In the 18th century, Bordeaux was richer than the French kingdom. Diallo from Senegal heads an association that raises awareness and offers tours of Bordeaux's slave trading past, a past he believes the city has not fully come to terms with. The image of wine is very hard to reconcile with the image of slavery. That is why the town was very late in giving history the place it merited in public spaces and schools. The few markers of this past are small and hard to find, and Diallo says there are more than a dozen Baldo streets named after prominent slave traders. Many residents have only a patchy knowledge of the city's role in the slave trade. Yes, I know about it because we study it in uh, history class, but uh, don't, I don't know a lot of things about it. Bordeaux city government now agrees more should be done at a time when the anti-immigrant far right is surging in France. It set up a commission to study the question. We have to fight more than ever to defend fundamental rights and equality. But it's not about guilt or repentance. Bordeaux citizens are not responsible for what their ancestors did. Diallo believes education is the answer to confronting racism, past and present. The more we understand, he says, the less we hate. Lisa Bryant for VOA News, Bordeaux, France. Uh, since the production of uh, the that uh, Voice of America re um, report, the association for the uh, for, called Memoir et Partage has been very, very active and very instrumental and inspirational in changing the memory landscape of Bordeaux. You, um, you'll be able to hear my full um, interview. It's a 30-minute interview with Carfa Diallo, the man you see here, um, as he goes into details on the challenges, the reasonings, the education um, efforts. Uh, you'll be able to see that on our YouTube channel. You can also take tours with him and his organizations and others while you're in Bordeaux as well and learn more. And what you'll see more of when you are there that you didn't see in the in the first video, there are more, uh, for example, statues and tributes in main places in Bordeaux. This one is one of the most recent ones. It is called the it's actually called Strange Fruit, and it's and it is installed in the garden of the city hall. So there is lots to see while you are in Bordeaux and learn more about his about its its not only its world class history but it's also its uh, its history as a slave trading in, uh, port. The interview, interview you'll be able to see um, with Carfa Diallo, it will be in French. I just wanted to mention it'll be in French. You can see it on our, you'll be able to see it on our Connect to Black Heritage YouTube channel. And when, if you sign up for notifications, you can get a notification when we upload the, the version that's um, subtitled or dubbed. So that wraps up our program on the resistance in France. There is so much that I could have spoken about that I could have filled in with, but it's a jumping off point uh, for you to learn and to discover more. Thank you again to the International Committee of the uh, of Asala, the Association for the uh, Study of African American Life and History, for inviting us to be part of this program. And thank you, listeners, for watching and to listening into this program.